Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 177, From Blog to Book, Repurposing Your Nonfiction, coming to you on Thursday, January 30th, 2020. Well, last night I did something very exciting and helped a friend hit a milestone in his life. We finished editing his very first book and got it up on Amazon through KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. And we had every single thing ready. So all he had to do was look at it all one more time and hit the publish button. It was very exciting. <laughs> It's always exciting to do it. It's particularly exciting, your first book. And he said something that I think I probably was thinking when I was first about ready to hit that button on my book. Oh my gosh, am I really done? Is it really ready? <laughs> so it's very, very exciting times. And if you are writing nonfiction or have been blogging or writing any other kind of article, something that is basically not a story. I wanted to tell you some things about how you can look at whether or not do you have already written work that is a book. So for instance, um, I have worked with three authors now who had been writing for years, I'm pretty sure, um, small bits, guest articles, guest blog posts, uh, articles that might have gone to a magazine, um, all sorts of different short pieces of nonfiction having to do with what they were partic particularly um, good at themselves. So for instance, um, my friend last night, he's a pastor, so he was writing a book for pastors and churches. I've worked with an another fellow who is in television, so he was writing a book for people in television. And I worked with another fellow who was a composer who was writing a book towards musicians. So in each case, all of them had already written a lot of short pieces and wondered whether or not they had already written enough material to create a book. So here are my steps for you deciding whether or not you have the material for a book. First, what you want to do is go find all of the stuff that you've written. Some of it, remember, may not be on your website. It might have been a guest post on someone else's. These are the things that I find most easy to lose, forget, um, sometimes not even sure where I kept a copy of it. So how do I even find things that I can't remember <laughs> that I wrote? So being organized when you're writing is also very, very important. I have found mostly a way for, for me to be more organized and find that work now. Um, and then look for everything that you have written that might all be part of a same similar topic and be particularly asking yourself, um, what is the work that I still own the copyright on? So for instance, if you sold a piece to a magazine in the United States, you might have sold them first North American rights, which means that they got to be the first ones to print it in North America. So including uh, United States, Canada, Mexico. Um, but after that, the reprint rights reverted back to you. Okay, now <clears throat> this might be more information than you know that much about. So you could just Google um, publishing rights or explain North American rights. If you even get at the beginning of this topic, you should be able to find um, articles that explain the entirety of it. Um, because we are so small world worldwide right now, um, it may be that if you have sold something to a website or a magazine, you might have sold first world rights, which means they got to be the first person to publish it all over the world, um, but you still kept your reprint rights. But if you have sold some other kind of right, um, particularly if it's for a period of time, then you need to be sure that you're not violating the copyright that you have already licensed to someone else. So if you have only been publishing on your blog, you own all the rights to your work if it's only appeared on your blog. Let me, let me just be really simply simple and clear about that part. So first step is finding all of your information and looking at it all and trying to see if it's pretty much one big topic if there are several topics that one of them probably would make an interesting book, 
um, but putting all of them together might just make a mess? Or are there a couple of different books here because you have a lot of information on two or three or four different topics or related but different enough? You know, because then it could be a series of books. Or is it kind of more of a, a general topic, like um, just talking in general about family or relationships or um, the psychology of dogs? <laughs> so once you've decided whether or not you're going to be looking at all of your work from a general topic perspective or a specific topic perspective, then we are going to go on to step two which is gather everything together in either a printed form or a digital form or both. Some of you are going to be like me, where you like having things in your hand. You have a, a tactile sense to you that needs to be used. <laughs> you like um, writing notes in pen on paper. This is excellent because there is a certain amount of proofreading that when you do it on the computer and you're 100% sure that you have gotten every single uh, typo and other error totally corrected and you know that there's nothing left to correct and then you get that book in print, <laughs> maybe not even having gotten a print proof yet and then you find that one or two errors that you never saw. This has happened to me before. <laughs> In fact, um, there's sometimes that an error gets by you after you've even done the print proof. But anyway, the point is, is that you need to make sure that you have got everything together so that you can look at it all as a body of work. And if you want to do it digitally, you might put it, um, I, I would never be able to see the big picture if I just put a whole bunch of articles, one right after another in a Word document. I would just see a whole bunch of articles. I wouldn't be able to really see the big picture. So I have a tendency to print it out and or, and for me, it's been and uh, the last few years. I put everything in Scrivener so that I can see all of the individual topics. And if the title of the article or blog isn't really clear, then in the heading on the left side of Scrivener, I'll just change the title to be um, what the actual point uh, of that article or blog post is. Um, so it might be only a few words, but something where I can specifically just look right down that left side list and go, okay, well, these four things are all about this topic and these six things are all similar to this. And these two aren't really related to either one of those, but Oh, but this one could sort of be a transition from A to C. There's this one article that kind of fits into B. You see what I mean? So when you have gathered everything together, that's step two. Now you are trying to figure out step three, how to put it all in a logical order. One of the hardest things to remember is that you are creating a book now. And even though you have written all of these articles and your brain may still see them as a whole bunch of individual pieces, what you're creating is one single piece. And sometimes one of the hardest parts is being able to see it all as one single piece. So starting from the very first one, whichever one you thought would be the best way to introduce the topic. And if you're if you're building something, if you're creating a how-to or creating something that needs a foundation that's going to build up to the pinnacle of, oh, here it is. This is what we, you know, read this whole book to get to this point. Um, you want to make sure that you're starting in a way that really is the beginning. Now, that might not always be the case. Sometimes you're starting with um, what might be the most interesting topic first, or maybe it's the most interesting one to you, or it's the topic that you've had the most questions about throughout your career. So there's a lot of places where you could start, but the, the, the third step is to just try to put everything in a logical order so that it seems to read smoothly and um, is building towards something at the end, or you can have it in various parts so that, um, you know, a, a general topic book actually could have um, several individual parts that are pretty related. So, this is what you're trying to figure out is how what you've written and we're looking at the best of what you've written, not all of what you've written. 
But of all the articles, for instance, that I wrote for the Routine Survivors blog, I was one of three three authors. We uh, posted weekly. Uh, so there was actually three posts a week since there were three of us. Um, and we did this for five or more years. I, I'm feeling like it was somewhere around five-ish. That's a lot of articles. I probably had 200, 250 articles, depending on whether or not I ever, um, you know, reprinted or um, what am I trying to say? You know, like reposted something. So definitely 250 articles over five years. There's no way that all that stuff is still um, interesting, A, because uh, some of it was timely. Uh, sometimes they were like, you know, a happy Thanksgiving posts or Merry Christmas, we're off on vacation. Um, that is not really going to fit into my book on how writers can create great routines for themselves. But if I had six articles that I had written over the course of five years about um, getting together with other writers to get more writing done, then it's possible, it's, it's possible that all six of them were excellent. It's probable that three or four of them were excellent. <laughs> and it's very likely that altogether throughout those six articles, there is quite a lot of really good information that then would need to be edited down together. So <laughs> part of step three depending on uh, what you want to do and whether or not uh, you have money to do it, is to actually create your first outline and then send it to an editor. An editor who particularly specializes in uh, nonfiction. Now, if you're thinking about traditionally publishing, the, um, the way that you would approach an agent or editor for nonfiction is different from fiction. For nonfiction, you pretty much just have to have an outline of the entire book plus a couple of your best chapters. For fiction, for the most part, you send in three chapters, but you're supposed to send them in after you've written the entire book. And so you send in three chapters in a synopsis. Um, these are generalities, but in general, you don't have to have written the entire nonfiction book before you've print, uh, pitched it. However, in the type of nonfiction that we're talking about now, which is repurposing work that you've already written, you've already got it down. What you need to know is, is this an interesting topic and have I presented it in a way that sounds interesting enough that we could sell a book? Okay, so what you're doing is you're either sending this and, and you can Google how to uh, send a nonfiction query to an agent or editor. You're either sending this to a traditional uh, agent or editor, or you're looking at self-publishing. And so you're looking for an editor that you can hire to look over your outline themselves and let you know whether or not it looks like it's clear and that it's going to hit the target that you're aiming at. Um, the, the point of you writing this book, you know, whether it's a specific topic or a general topic, does the way that you have put everything together so far seem like it's probably going to be giving the book that you're trying to create. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So if you are um, skipping that step or you've already done that step or you know that you're going to uh, self-publish this book, there is more to do. <laughs> so now you've put things in the best order that you can, uh, either by yourself or with the help of an editor. And now you're going to put all of your articles or blog posts or whatever it is that you've collected over time uh, into an order um, and then read it through as if it is a book. So step three was put it in a, in a logical order. Step four is read it through as if it's a book. This is where you want to turn off the part of your brain that already knows that you wrote all these articles and stop thinking about them as articles and read this through as if it's a book. Now, I will tell you that one of the most difficult things uh, that you will find is how to create transitions between excellent blog post A and excellent blog post B and C and D. 
The other thing is, is that you need to be very willing and looking for places where you can improve these so that they stop sounding, the transitions will be part of what helps it to stop sounding like a whole bunch of blog posts in a row and more like a chapter of a book. But you're also looking for places where you can do editing. What needs to be added now that it's going into a book form? What needs to be changed? What needs to be deleted? What needs to be updated because it's old information? And now you're trying to get everything written together as if it were flowing just like a book. These are the notes that you're making here in step four. Okay, now step five might be do step five, then do step five again, then do step five again, because it's rewriting. So once you've sat down and read the entire thing through, I always recommend doing it on paper because again, I feel like, um, well, not just me. I know that this definitely works for me, but that's because I've heard other people preach it and I tried it and I was like, hmm, yes, I do catch more things when I'm doing it on paper than when I'm doing it digitally. Uh, however you decide to do it, you're gonna take all those notes that you made and you're gonna do your rewrite. Now, keep in mind that you don't necessarily want to rewrite as you go, you want to read the whole book all the way through because you may find that a problem that you had, you know, three or four articles in is solved by moving maybe the 12th article up to the third place. So moving things around is a big part of what you're going to be like, okay, now this really, this, this is a better foundation. This is building more naturally, more organically. It makes a lot more sense now. This is what you're doing in step five. You're rewriting, reading again, taking more notes, doing some more rewrites. You're probably going to be doing less and less with each round. And I wouldn't necessarily count them and go, oh, it was, I'm on my fifth rewrite now. Because what you're doing is you're just reading through, reading through, reading through over and over, looking for more clear ways to say what your main point is, what your main point of the book is not the 32 main points of the 32 articles that you decided to use for your book, but your main point for your new book. Okay. Now, because um, if you have this much work already published, this is probably going to be um, some older work as well as newer work, then you're going to want to be sure that um, you have updated anything that could be old, made things more clear, um, added extra notes about um, new ways that you might be able to do this thing, new technology that's being used, old technology that is kind of on its way out. Um, it just depends on your topic, but you want to make sure that you're being as clear as you can possibly be. And then can you be more clear? And then can you make it sound even more smooth with even better transitions? Can you move this paragraph? Can you delete that paragraph? When you feel like you've done all that you can, then kind of the last part of step five, which is this reading and making notes and rewriting, um, is you want to um, send this, what is your current final draft, to a few friends, who, this is important, who are actually people who would buy this type of book. So for instance, if I sent my book on Routines for Writers to my friend who's a nurse, I wouldn't really be able to expect much from her except for, well, it, it made sense to me and your grammar and spelling seemed to be good, so I don't really have any notes for you. No, not helpful. <laughs> if I was sending my Routines for Writers book to somebody who was a brand new writer who had just started last month because they decided 2020 is the year, they'd never written anything before. I'm going to get a totally different um, kind of feedback and notes from that person as I would from somebody who's been a writer for 20 years and has been earning money for much of that time and has been trying to figure out in their own business, how can I do this better, more efficiently, have it take less time, have it be more fun. So be sure that who you're sending the book to is somebody who actually knows enough about the topic and is interested enough in the topic that they would be one of your target market if you were selling the book today. Okay. Um, of course, if you're sending it to somebody who's really good at spelling and punctuation and grammar and uh, all those sorts of things, and that doesn't hurt either. <laughs> Hopefully the book is already really good at those points. But um, if you need somebody to read that over, 
definitely do that. Okay, step six, take those reader's notes and all that feedback and incorporate what you think is going to be the best additions. Now, not everything that every single person says to you is going to be applicable and needs to be changed in your book. If one person is like, I really didn't understand the story on page 72, but nobody else mentioned it, then I would reread the story on 72, try to figure out from the reader's notes, like what didn't they understand? See if you can make it more clear. If, however, four out of six people said, story on on page 72 didn't really seem to make it sense, kind of like came out of nowhere. I don't see how it really applied to the rest of, you know, what was in that chapter. Then you may seriously want to consider whether or not that story needs to be in there. Is it in the wrong place? Should it be deleted entirely? (laughs) So keeping in mind that while you don't want to take every single piece of advice from every single person who offers it, because we all know that advice is free and sometimes it's worth exactly what you pay for it, You do, however, want to be aware of trends when several people don't understand something, okay? So step six, incorporate the reader's notes and feedback that you think is actually going to improve the book because you're like, yep, I see how that could be a little bit better. This is the best part about getting feedback is when you're putting it in and you're like, yeah, it really did make my book better. Yay, (laughs) thank you, friends. And then step seven, When you feel you're really, really, really done, and this kind of is is another part of step three, where step 3A was hire an editor um, or send to an editor. Step seven is hire an editor. (laughs) When you think that you cannot find any way to make this book any better, and you know that you're going to self-publish it, not traditionally publish it, you still need to, either at the beginning or the end or both, have had a professional editor look at it to make sure that the big picture really does make sense. You're saying what you are trying to say. Readers are hearing what you are trying to say. Um, that the whole thing flows smoothly. That there's no place that's even a little bit tricky or messes people up a little bit, confuses people a little bit. That it's genuinely super smooth. And um, an editor in your field of nonfiction. Uh, And a lot of times uh, a nonfiction editor will not necessarily have uh, specific topics that they edit, but um, just that in general they edit nonfiction. That means that they're able to see a big picture of a a topic that's not a story, (laughs) so fiction. Uh, They can see these big pictures and see whether or not you are actually creating the big picture that you're sort of advertising it to be. As, as the book that you are writing. Does that make sense? Okay. I know that sometimes it's difficult to, um, to put yourself out there and spend the money on, on making your book what you hope to be better, but it probably will be better. If you hire even a remotely good editor, it will be better. And altogether, it will be worth it because there is so much competition with a number of books out there. There are plenty of readers who are looking for what you want to share with them. But your book needs to be not just good. It needs to be really good. It needs to be a really good book in order to beat out the other good books. So that's why I think it's important for you to strongly consider uh, hiring someone who can make sure that what you've created is not leaving any questions. It's the same reason why I I and tons of other people in the business um, strongly encourage fiction writers to have an editor at some stage in the process. So if you're traditionally publishing, you will have an editor, you will be fine. You don't need to hire another editor. Not unless you're traditionally publishing with somebody who is, um, you know, uh, I don't even want to say. But it, if it's a good publisher, you don't need to hire another publisher. You don't need to hire another editor. Um, they are going to do all the work that I'm talking about. But if you're self-publishing, you need to make sure that your book is so good that it's going to beat out the rest of the competition, so that you can get your share of readers who are looking to learn about what you want to tell them about. Okay. Now, if you, again, are not 
uh, going to self-publish, but you're traditionally publishing, you can just go ahead and start your query to agents and editors at almost any point in this process. They need less information from you than, um, for the most part, when you query fiction agents and editors. They want the entire manuscript available to them so that if they read the first few chapters and they're like, yeah, this looks like something that I would be interested in, you can immediately send them the whole book. They don't want to wait six or 12 months for you to finish the book. Um, nonfiction is not really the same. So again, you can send out, um, it just uh, Google how to, you know, query a nonfiction book. Um, but you can send out your query with just the outline and a few chapters. Now, part of the reason why I bring that back around to the after step seven, even though I also talked about it as a po potential step three, is because it still doesn't hurt to make sure you are putting your best foot forward and that the chapters that you've sent them, you've really thought about it and you've really found a way to make these four articles sound like one really natural, um, very understandable chapter, a chapter of a book, not four articles. So all that editing is actually still really important. All right. So you have either sent your book to a traditional publisher and yay you, you're ready. You're going to have a book sometime or you have decided to go the self-publishing route and you have done all of this work. The book is just really cannot be made better. It can't be made more clear. It is a really good book. Maybe it's even a great book. Then you are ready for the very last step, which is get your cover, get your, you know, get a good cover designer. <laughs> get your cover, write your book description, which is your back cover copy. Um, it's called the back cover copy because it's usually the same information is on the back cover of your book is what's on the description page at Amazon and Kobo and iTunes and all the other places where you buy eBooks or buy books. Um, uh, anyway, it's very, very important marketing copy. <laughs> your description is very important. Uh, and then, um, do the thing that we did last night, hit the publish button. It's very exciting, very terrifying, but very exciting. And then after that, you learn to do your marketing and that is an entirely different topic. So I am not going to go into that now, but I figured, you know, uh, I just finished helping a friend do this last night, and this is the third time that I've helped somebody uh, totally put together a book. Actually, um, my friend from last night did a lot more of the work himself, which was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, cool for him because he, he learned how to do it all. Um, but uh, I thought I should just share this in a way that more people can uh, take advantage of it. So hopefully... This has got you thinking about work that you've already written that you can find some interesting way to make it into a book that people are like, wow, this is a great book. I'm totally buying it and reading it right now. <laughs> That's always a good feeling to know that somebody is having that, that feeling right now, that thought that your book is this great book that they can't wait to read and buy. Yay. Okay. So Lots of luck to you as you get ready to hit that point. It's probably an awful lot of work away from right now, but I think that you'll find it's worth it. Um, I find it very fun to go through a whole bunch of, okay, I like puzzles and maybe that's uh, a little bit of a help to you. If you uh, like the idea of a jigsaw puzzle, that's kind of what you're working on. Each individual piece has its own tiny little story that it's telling, but it's when you put them all together in the right order that it has a really big story that it's telling. And even though we're talking about nonfiction, it's still a story that it's telling. So that's kind of the, the, that's the big picture of what this whole episode was about, is putting together the puzzle with all of the little pieces that you already have. And you may find that there that you have three quarters of a puzzle, in which case you're like, oh, all right, I need to write some chapters on this, this, and this. And you may find that as you're going through it, maybe um, you don't have a ton of time to just sit down and madly, you know, go crazy on this for a few weeks or a few months or whatever. Um, what you may also find is that you're like, okay, you know what, I'm going to write three more articles for my blog on these topics that are 
missing in the book, but then I'm going to also sort of rewrite them in a way that these articles plus some more information are the missing chapters that I needed in order to make this book that I have in my mind that I can see the big picture of to make it final and finished. So there you go. Good luck. I hope you have a great writing week, whatever you're writing. And I hope that you um, just feel really excited about your writing life in 2020. I know I sure do. And um, I'm excited to share some more encouraging words with you on Sunday. Have a great week.